Aloha and welcome to season two, episode three of Figments on reality, my non-political, non-vitriolic uh, commentary show. The season two, episode three thing is something I do not to because they're real seasons, but actually just to keep my graphics and notes or, organized in my uh, computer. Someday I'll count up how many shows I've done, quite a few all this year. And I thought I'd give you a peek behind the curtain before we get into today's topic. Um, Figments and the, the how I do it is first of all is with the help of Think Tech Hawaii, a great nonprofit uh, company, been around for 20 years, and they do 30 broadcasts a week. And I encourage you to do two things: go to their website, check out the very diverse op offerings they have, and donate because they are a nonprofit corporation that requires relies on your largesse to continue their good work in the community. So they make it all work. They take my graphics and fold them in. They make the, the uh, captions and everything else and prepare the broadcast. Sometimes the sound is imperfect here at home and they'll fix that. Uh, Eric, the engineer is on right now, so I'll give him a shout out. So he pays special attention today, but uh, ThinkTech makes that all work. Uh, it's filmed in my studio. No, actually in my home office. Uh, we're all Zoom right now. They do have a studio and have done interviews at ThinkTech in a studio. That's how I first learned about them. Um, but the Zoom thing works pretty well. Uh, and it's broadcast live and usually, sometimes I pre-record because of schedule conflicts, but almost always live. And I have a lot of technical things to worry about, like wardrobe. You'll understand why I'm wearing a plain black shirt today when we get to the topic. I want to make sure that the shirt looks good. I have my fashion consultant, my wife Alejandra, do that. And then we worry about lighting and sound. And I'm gonna share this because if you do a lot of Zoom meetings and wanna look good, especially say for a job interview, there are a few things I've learned. One is the best thing to do is get good lighting. And I've got a ring light and another desk lamp and I make sure the windows are open and we tweak that with the engineer uh, before every show. The sound is important. Um, I use, as you can see, an AirPod Pro for my listening to uh, what else is going on, like an interview with the guest. And then an Elgato Wave 3 microphone that filters out a lot of the background noise because there is no way to ensure yard work or construction like starting a Figment's broadcast. Pretty quiet today. Maybe we'll have a helicopter fly by to fix that. But a good microphone will take out a lot of background noise. And so, like I said, if you if you need to do well on Zoom or any other platform, um, put a little time and money into uh, how it works. Uh, I spent several hours, I hope this shows, in preparation for each episode uh, from the time of inception to getting ready for the broadcast. I prepare the graphics. I like to use photos to illustrate it. Uh, but there, we have to be really careful for copyright infringement. YouTube is, is a stickler for not um, infringing on somebody's intellectual property. Uh, and I just make a PowerPoint slide and then Eric and the team uh, turn it into good graphics and they display it when it's supposed to be displayed, which is pretty cool. And then I have to get it all done in 28 minutes. And that's probably the biggest challenge. I'll be looking at the clock. I know I'm three minutes in-ish right now. And uh, the first 15 minutes go by slowly. And then the next thing I know, I'm at 28 minutes. It, it's an interesting phenomenon that happens every show. And I'm sure well, this one will happen this time. Uh, once we finish the live broadcast on Think Tech Hawaii, they clean it up, sound, distractions, any awkward pauses. Uh, they edit it a bit, not for content, but for style. And then they'll post it on YouTube, Vimeo, and as a podcast on Apple Podcasts and uh, on Spotify. I share my uh, notices of shows through an email blast. I try not to abuse that, but if you would like to get uh, notified when there's a new broadcast, a new Figments, either version, Figments on Reality or Figments, The Power of Imagination, send me an email at info at phase-1.com. That's info at P-H-A-S-E-M-I-N-U-S, the number one, dot com, and I'll add you to the mailing list. And again, I, I promise not to abuse that. So that's how I do figments. Why do I do it? Let me assure you, it is not for the money. Uh, figments, like ThinkTech, is a totally nonprofit endeavor. 
there is no no money is harmed in the making of these pod, these webcasts. Uh, I, so I don't do it for the money, but I've been blessed with an interesting life, and I hope that's given me some insight and experiences that you find valuable when I share them. And I made some amazing friends and have some family that's pretty amazing too. And so I like to uh, bring them on and share their stories with you. Uh, and I do that to enter entertain, to inspire, and uh, just to give you some food for thought. Not because I'm right. I'm sure I'm not always right, maybe totally wrong. But hopefully the way I present it in a non-political manner will give you that food for thought. Uh, I try to end with what would Fig do? That came up in my second edition of Fig, ep, second episode of Figments, The Power of Imagination, with former Chief of Staff Dave Fingers Goldfein, when he said in, somewhere in the broadcast, uh, as a leader later, he had worked for me at Aviano in combat. He said, I'd ask myself, what would Fig do? Now, he did not elaborate. He said, he may have meant, I'd ask, what would Fig do, and then go in the other direction? I hope not, but I want to give you something to do about the problems I present or to think about on the issue, the stories I share. The ideas just happen. Um, for example, our next, my next Power of Imagination a week from today will be with a golfing friend, an Air Force friend of mine who brought it up at the golf course. I'll share that with you in a bit. Others happen serendipitously, world events, Afghanistan, for example, present themselves. Or today, let's talk about today. How did today's episode happen? Today's episode happened uh, because I looked at the calendar, which I have to do to try to keep my schedule organized. I'm a lousy personal assistant, executive assistant, by the way. But I looked at the calendar and today is November 22nd. And I remembered immediately that today is the anniversary of the assassination of John F. Kennedy. I do remember that day well, even though I was just 11 years old. Um, the entire nation was in shock when the president was assassinated, regardless of where he stood politically. Uh, it was truly a black swan. Uh, the impossible had happened. And that's really what I want to talk about today is black swan events. And I've got a definition here. The black swan is when the impossible happens. It started being used first in uh, financial lingo. A guy named Nassim Nicholas Taleb uh, wrote several books that allude to the black swan. And it's a phenomenon thought to be impossible because for a long time, black swans weren't known to exist. They were discovered in Australia. And the assassin assassination of President Kennedy was a black swan. Now, the, there's a lot more to the black swan event. It's not everything that's surprising, but that is element number one of a black swan event. It's surprising to the observer. Second, by uh, Taleb's definition, it has to have a major effect. And the effect can be positive, but the events are almost always negative, according to him. Um, but surprise, a major effect. And then finally, and this is one of the most fascinating elements of the back, black swan is after the event occurs, it's rationalized by hindsight. We look back and say, no, oh, yeah, we should have seen that coming, or I knew that could happen, but we didn't see that coming. And the unthinkable assassination of President Kennedy was a black swan. We didn't see it coming. And the effect and of course, many rationalized that we should have, including conspiracy theorists. We didn't see it coming, and the effect was so great, I think it changed our nation, and not in a good way, um, because there were more assassinations in the ensuing decade and more, uh, and attempts, and uh, Martin Luther King, George Wallace, uh, Robert F. Kennedy, attempts on Gerald Ford and Ronald Reagan, and that was a significant change in our political landscape that, that I think uh, had a negative effect uh, in accessibility, but also just in how we viewed ourselves as a nation. Um, uh, another area where I think it had a dramatic and deleterious, I think that means bad, impact was in trust of the government. The conspiracy theories survived. Now, I don't buy them. Sorry, please drop me a note if you think I should, but I don't buy the conspiracy theories, but they're out there and they're persistent. 
and they all involve distrusting the government. And I think that the president, uh, the President Kennedy's assassination and the aftermath, including the Warren Commission investigation, seriously eroded trust in our government. And part of that was due to a lack of transparency. There's a lesson there, folks. We do need transparent government. I still don't think we have it. Um, but it eroded the public trust, and that's not good in a democracy. We don't have to like what our leaders, our elected officials do, but we should have a good full view of it. And as I look at the headlines, whether it's a politician on the right, left, or in between, my first response is, I probably really don't know. They're probably not sharing anything. And I think that's been uh, exacerbated by the information age where there's so much out there, but everything out there might not include the real facts or the real truth. So I think the assassination of Kennedy, that, it, that black swan event, damaged our uh, country in ways that can't be measured. There have been other black swans. Um, the atom bomb, when dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, was a black swan event for the world. Now, people knew that it was coming, people in the US defense establishment, certainly those involved in the Manhattan Project knew. I'll share a little family story. My father, Bob Leaf, was studying physics at the University of Wisconsin. The Navy had kind of pulled him out of high school early, age 16, I think, to go study physics at the University of Wisconsin. And as he told the story, um, they all they knew was they were getting a very intense uh, education in physics with a lot of one-on-one -on -one tutorials from very high-level high professors. Um, and uh, they would finish their degree program in about two years. That's the way I remember his story. But when the atom bomb was actually dropped on Hiroshima, he and his one classmate in this V-12 program, it was called the Navy's program, looked at each other and said to themselves, now we know why we're here. So it was a black swan even to those involved tangentially or peripherally with the effort to perfect the atom bomb. Clearly the effect is beyond describing this episode. Um, and some may say, oh yeah, we knew they were working on that, but it was a surprise. Sputnik was another surprise and is, uh, Sputnik is often held up as, as the ultimate black swan event, the surprise that the Russians could put a satellite in space, a functioning satellite and, and the ensuing uh, race to space. And um, that may be, a, it was a negative event to the United States. We got beat to that objective by the Russians uh, but with a positive outcome, it energized our space race. A lot of benefits have come out of the peaceful use of space, and uh, including the trip to the moon. So surprise, major effect. Rationalized in hindsight, I don't know that that fits for the Sputnik, but I think it fits the criteria. There recently was one that I mentioned in one of my recent Pigments episodes, and that was the Chinese launch of a hypersonic weapon, which surprised a lot of people. Now, I'm not in the defense business anymore. I, I hope they weren't as surprised as, as it seems from reading articles uh, about the event. Um, but the defense establishment, several key officials have said, well, I don't know that this has been a Sputnik moment, but it should be. So... This black swan, the Chinese possession of a hypersonic weapon, and it's a little more complicated than that, but should spur concern, response, perhaps investment, not conflict, because what we have to make sure we do is can do is deter conflict. Um, the it, it has been asserted, and I think agree it, that I agree that uh, almost all major. Uh, technical advancements, technological advancements are in fact black swans and good, some good things can come out of them. The, the expansion and ready, ready access to expansion of and ready access to the internet is a good example. But um, I'd say cell phones have, have more effect, frankly, my assessment. I don't want to spend too much time on that, 
but, but I will want you to mention one more tsunami or one more uh, black swan, and that's the Boxing Day tsunami in 2004, that incredible disaster uh, took everybody by surprise. And in hindsight, we could have been more ready for the earthquake and ensuing tsunami, but we weren't. And hopefully the preparedness we see now with the tsunami warning system means that we were paying attention. So as I thought about black swans, I thought what other black swans are in the world today that might be flying and might be important to folks for folks to think about. And I thought about Chile, not just because my wife Alejandra is a native of Santiago de Chile, but uh, because they experienced a black swan in October of 2018 and the effects are still occurring and the future is very uncertain because of it. So in October of 2019, um, I'm sorry, 2018, if I said 19, 2018, uh, the government raised the fares on the metro in the capital city, Santiago, by 30 pesos. In US dollars, that's five cents. Not a big increase um, and probably needed. But uh, Chile had been the darling of Latin America, the model of stability uh, for the 30 years of democratization following the departure of the Pinochet junta. And uh, it was a, it's a developing company, country. It still ranks 43rd of 189 countries in the world on the Human Development Index, which includes health, economy, and education. So it's a you know pretty stable country, and it's a the highest ranking of all the Latin American countries on the HDI, the Human Development Index. So cool. What happened after they raised the subway fare 30 pesos? The country descended into unprecedented chaos, violence, and destruction, and political unrest. Uh, tremendous, massive destruction uh, from riots inside Santiago. It was incredible to see. It's a beautiful city and imperfect like every metropolitan area, but this was terrible. And the subway system, focal point of the unrest at first, was a big target for this unrest and, and virtually destroyed uh, all over 30 pesos. Nobody expected it, but it wasn't about 30 pesos. It was about 30 cents or it was about 30 years. 30 years of dissatisfaction broadly with the government in both major parties. And um, it has changed Chile forever and may change it even further uh, because the, you know, there was the violence and destruction and 36 dead, but it ripped at the social fabric of the country and drove the people I would submit to polar opposites. And that's witnessed by an election just held yesterday, a presidential election. And in that, in this election, the two candidates who will face in a runoff are at polar opposites, Boric, the left wing, and Kos, the right wing. I don't know who's going to win it, but it's further complicated by another effect of that 30 peso swan uh, constitutional convention. All of the unrest made people uh, agree that there was need for a revi revision to the constitution and passed a, a new constitution. They may have agreed, but they didn't participate. And only 43% of Chilean voters voted for the delegates to the convention. And now that convention is made up very predominantly from people from the left. And what does that mean? They're gonna have a constitution that a significant majority, minority, plural, I don't know, but a big part of the po population isn't going to like it. And it's a pretty extreme constitution as currently drafted. Um, I don't know if Kast or Boric will win the election. Um, if it's Boric, then that constitution and the new president are going to take Chile in, in directions that are going to change the country. If Cost is elected and opposes the new constitution, that's another difficult situation with the potential for even more un unrest. And folks, these effects can't be undone. We can't rewind to uh, September of 2018 and say, but let's start over. Um, and I'll let you know why I think that's important to Americans 
right after a quick break to talk about that next episode of Figments, The Power of Imagination, coming up on November 29th, the week from today at 2 p.m. Hawaii Standard Time with Colonel Ed Hawkins, a great friend, former Air Force Colonel. He was an intelligence analyst. He's a really smart guy. I like to talk to him a lot. He's a much better golfer than I am, but I don't think he has a hole in one. I'll have to ask him. Um, so uh, Ed's gonna, brought up the idea of talking about uh, China-Taiwan conflict and what it would mean to Hawaii. And uh, he has some really interesting views. It's something we should be concerned about. And by the way, if you're not watching in Hawaii, uh, it's part of America, folks. So you know that. And the consequences may be magnified here in the islands, but they'll be significant throughout the country. Okay, so let's get back to black swans and why Chile could, what happened in Chile couldn't possibly happen in the United States, nor could it. <laughs> when it was occurring, I said to Alejandro and Alejo, people don't realize this, but this could happen to the US because of our polarization. And sure enough, if you look at the events following the killing of George Floyd, uh, from January 6th to the riots, the violence, to everything. We're seeing unprecedented political dysfunction and a deep fractionalization of uh, America. We've had two spectacularly unpopular presidents. I'm not saying that uh, with a political bent, but neither President Trump or President Biden uh, have won the hearts and minds of enough of the population to be very effective. And I want our president to be effective, whomever he or she may be, and they're not. I think we've also seen somewhat with the additive effects of the pandemic, a breakdown in checks and balances on government. I'm not a conspiracy guy and I've got my vaccines and I know it's a, something of a, a conundrum to figure out how to tackle the pandemic while maintaining in individual liberty, but. I see the checks and balances, uh, sometimes from the left and sometimes the right from the right being eroded. And that's a fundamental concept underpinning American democracy. And guess what? That concerns me. And uh, we're facing fundamental change with the two recent infrastructure bills, if you will, that uh, about half the country doesn't appear to want. You know, we're that divided. And with one party in power in both houses and in the White House, you know, we're going to have, the, it could deepen the divide. And could this be the demise of American democracy? It could, but that's not a political view. That's a practical view. What can we do about it? Well, I'll start with vote, vote and vote. And my politics are between me and my ballot but I can't complain if I don't vote. And I generally don't complain in public about specific people or issues. But we ought to respect each other's views because no matter how far they are from yours, they deserve your respect. And I think we've stopped doing that as a nation and it's not healthy. It's not good for the country. It doesn't feel good either, by the way, but, but we've got to respect other views. And then I think a key is to learn again how to discuss and debate but don't dismiss, don't dismiss the views of others. Uh, you know, I've done a lot of writing and talking and thinking about North Korea. And uh, one of the things that always gets under my skin is when somebody says, well, Kim Jong-un or his father or grandfather are totally irrational. No, they're not. They just don't share our rationale. I'm not justifying the behavior of three dictators. I'm saying to dismiss it as irrational prevents you from looking inside it and trying to understand the rationale so that you can counter it effectively. So even at the extremes, respect the views of others as, as you examine them without validating, endorsing, or adopting them. You can still respect them. If we don't do that in the United States, I think we, we face the kind of uh, seismic shift the country of Chile is, work, is facing right now. And I hope it works out well for both countries, but we can't just wish for a brighter future. Are there, uh, are there cases worldwide where there are other black swans on the horizon? 
I think there are. I'm not going to talk about all of them today, but when you look at the protests in Europe over pandemic, uh, over pandemic enforcement measures, uh, and the departure of the United Kingdom, that's kind of a black swan from the European Union. The various refugee crises around the world are all creating tremendous change. And I won't even go into climate. Um, you can find several black swans orbiting around the climate crisis. Um, how about the collapse of North Korea? We might think that's good. Uh, and we may say, well, if we saw that coming. I've been predicting it for years. Well, in fact, I have been. I inaccurately predicted quite loudly that it would uh, collapse in late 1997. I checked. It hasn't. And I think the collapse is unlikely. The effects of that could be very bad or potentially very good. But what do we do about that? And now it's time for... What would Fig do? I would open, I would suggest we all should open our apertures to the impossible and recognize that almost nothing is impossible. And when it's a worst case impossibility, we can't, we can't build our lives around a low potential, uh, high impact, uh, near impossibility, but we ought to be ready for it in some regard. So open your ap aperture. Be involved. That's why I do figments. Okay? I want to be involved in the discussion. I want to be thinking and maybe influencing if you're so inclined to be influenced by my thoughts and uh, recognize that while we can't anticipate the impossible, we'll make the outcomes significantly worse by simply doing nothing. So let's not do nothing. Let's do something. Let's do something like say happy Thanksgiving to all my Figments viewers. I'm thankful for, for your support. If you do watch and you do like, please click like. You already know I don't get paid for it, but that helps get broader distribution on YouTube and other uh, media, and it makes your host feel good. Another great reason to do it. Um, and share it with others. Again, if you want to be on my mailing list and be advised of uh, of Figment's airings, then just send me an email at info at phase-one.com, info at phase-one.com. And note how Eric slapped that up there on the screen. Not good for podcasts, but for the rest of you, info at phase-one.com. And I'd also welcome any thoughts you have on future episodes. So again, Figment's on reality and Figment's The Power of Imagination are both brought to you by the wonderful folks at Think Tech Hawaii who deserve your support and they get my thanks for giving this citizen journalist the opportunity to share with you. Again, happy Thanksgiving and aloha. <laughs>